Welcome to the Sharkpreneur Podcast with Kevin Harrington and Seth Green. Kevin Harrington is the inventor of the infomercial, one of the original sharks from the hit TV show Shark Tank, and has generated over $5 billion in TV and digital direct response sales. Seth Green is the world's first trusted authority on cutting edge direct response marketing, a best-selling author, and the only three-time Marketer of the Year nominee. On the podcast, Kevin and Seth interview sharkpreneurs who share straight talk on what it takes to explode your business. Why do so many businesses struggle while others seem to explode overnight? Do you wish you had the secret to this type of exponential growth? Now, I've scaled more than 20 businesses to over $100 million, and it's not just luck. In my new book with Mark Tim, Mentor to Millions, you'll learn the repeatable framework I use in all my business ventures for massive success. Order at KevinMentor.com and get over $1,000 in bonuses. Head to KevinMentor.com. Welcome to the Sharkpreneur Podcast. This is your co-host, Seth Green. Today, I have the good fortune to be joined by Richard Brock, who CRM Magazine has called the father of CRM, Richard pioneered the Salesforce automation space by starting Brock Control Systems, which became the leading provider with a 15% worldwide market share of web-based CRM applications. In 93, Brock was the first CRM company to IPO, and in 2002 was recognized as the best performing stock in the US by cbsmarketwatch.com. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Seth. Well, let's go back in time a little bit. First of all, thank you for pioneering the industry we live on every single day and couldn't do business without. How did you get started? Well, you know, it's funny because I think differently than most folks. I'm a logic-based person. You know, I've majored in accounting and I like accounting. So I like quantitative methods like most accountants don't like, but I don't like natural sciences. So I don't like computer science, but I got into the software business because it was all logical. And I got into the CRM business because no one was actually writing anything down. But really the genesis for the starting the software business of CRM, and it's really where I think CRM is going today and sales is going today, I think the whole thing is going towards perceived value. And I learned that as practicing CPA is the importance of having a perceived value. And we've gone through all kinds of iterations. But as we go now into 2021 and people talk about how to be relevant to your clients, it's relevance, which is perceived value, which has even been compressed because people don't want to talk to anybody anymore. The phone, the last thing a phone is, is something that people talk on. So that's why I think the future of CRM, well, as redefined, if you will, it's about to break out. And it's not because people, you know, you have pioneers, and I could observe some of the pioneers in CRM, what they do differently, and I, I think you might find it interesting. But most importantly is it's going to be different. It's because people are behaving differently. It's be, not just to work from home. It's they're reading things, as you know, in your direct marketing. They respond. They're more educated. And so uh, not that they need to be, they're not, they can't sell them anymore. They have to buy. And to buy, you have to, you know, the others talk about being trustworthy. It's really about being relevant. So anyway, evolving there, I started off with this software package that I wrote for CPAs. And it was about time and billing. And it was about being relevant and showing the value of your services. And I did sell that thing. We sold it. I had 25% of the CPAs in the United States using that package. So that was a big market share. And it had to do with I changed the thing from just telling you how much you're owed to how long, telling you why it's appropriate that I'll build you that much. Kind of a shocking statement of perceived value when I was practicing as a CPA. I had a client that I went from one dentist in one, you know, who was referred by a veterinarian client of mine to eight dentists to one year. And the first dentist I went to had been with another CPA the year before, and I met with him and showed him what I was doing, increased my perceived value. So my invoice was almost 40% higher than the previous CPA, to which you know, I'm thinking he's going to punch me out when I gave the invoice. And I hit his table, and he stood up, and he says, that's not enough. He said, you did too much work for that. And so I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. What did I do different than the other guy? I had a higher perceived value because I showed him what I was doing. So my whole mindset, the success in the CRM was about – having that value proposition, a perceived value. And, you know, it's changing, but it's really coming back. That's the essence of sales today is perceived value, which people are calling conversation intelligence or they're calling it, you know, uh, AI to be relevant. But it's really relevance and perceived value. All right. So you built it in the accounting space. 
And then how did you acquire such a large percentage of the market share of CPAs nationwide? <laughs> well, I'm a CPA. And it's really funny because IBM said this is really cool stuff and it would sell the computer. So they would actually fly me around the country, which is why I've been to 47 states and been to Buffalo, which is close to where you live and this kind of stuff. And I do these webinars. And so like one of the thought provoking questions is, is who sets your billing rates in your firm? And all the people say, well, it's Johnny, Joe, Sue. And I said, no. It is not your firm. It's your clients that set your billing rates. And that's what separated me. And they went, you're right. And so I gave them a system that would show them how to increase the value, perceived value of their service. No, they didn't. I didn't help them do your income taxes. Yes, we had a package. But more importantly, our value add was those clients appreciate what you're doing they never did before. So it was perceived value even there. And that's why they said, yeah. Here's another thing, Seth, I think this kind of people would do today. But we did. It was wildly successful. We didn't have a money-back guarantee. We guaranteed suitability to purpose. No one does that. We says, if you find this product unsuitable for your use, return and get your money back. And so that's what you call building trust in a space to pond that I knew his needs. He goes, well, if you're going to absolutely, get, I mean, if I just don't think it's worthwhile, you're the judge. You get all your money back. And that built a very successful company. We, were, it was, we doubled every year for eight years in a row. So it was wildly successful. That is incredibly successful and amazing that you were able to do that. And then you went from there to an international publicly traded company, an international person serving over 20,000 users in over 20 companies. You've received all kinds of accolades. Why do you think the process was so successful? How did you stand out as other, you got imitators? It's an entire industry now. How did you differentiate yourself now that you're in such a cluttered marketplace? Well, you know, you have to evolve. And so right now we've evolved beyond the CRM into salesrelevance.com, which is about artificial intelligence. Now, you know, some of your other interview people talk about it being trustworthy, building trust, about preparing for the calls. And I'm saying, you know, that's a nice thing. It's like good health. And Seth, you should eat better and exercise more. Yeah, whatever. Okay. Well, you may or may not. Okay, and so the point is, is, is in reps today, people don't answer their phone, and they see the number, they go, I'm not talking to Seth, they don't answer the phone. So people that track the calls say, you're lucky if you can get 20%, I think the number is 15% of the people on a good list will answer your call when you call. So if you're trying to make a lot of calls, you prepare for 100 calls, and you talk to 15 people, you wasted 85% of your time. So you can't, and, and when you were preparing for a meeting, and I'm going to show up and meet with Seth, ah, I better prepare. And it's worth the time. Seth will be there. He'll spend you know, 30 minutes with me. It's worthwhile. But when Seth may give me three minutes, and Seth ain't going to give me two minutes if I don't start off with an opening relevant statement. So the game changed. So I'm thinking if you can't prepare for a call, but yet you must be prepared for a call, and I know you in the, in the marketing space know about, like we use Zoom Info. And Zoom Info has all these persona stuff. And so I'm thinking an opening statement has to be relevant to you. Different titles, different industries, different size. And so that's how we differentiate. For example, if I'm selling to market leader, I say, you know, your title is a little wimpy, funded, BC funded people that nip at your heels, right? And he goes, yeah, brother. But if you're a market challenge, you say, you're tired of those big guys, those big budgets, and they step right on top of you, they crap your product, crap your support. And he goes, right. So you must be relevant. You must relate to them. And you can't. So we're using AI and the information from Zoom Info and others to have a personalized opening statement and to maintain that relevance. So it's evolved. The whole thing evolved. And the internet did it, if you will. And work from home made things even escalate even faster. Okay. So tell me a little bit more about how salesrelevance.com works. You're populate, you're making it CRM on steroids, right? Tell me a little more. Well, the first thing we do is we recognize that CRM has become a system of record. And, you know, to the uh, other people, they've established that like CEOs love it because it does the reporting. It keeps the board happy. It doesn't make any more sales, but it keeps the board happy because the forecasts are accurate, et cetera. But all the people, including like Neil Rackham, one of the pioneers of the space, said CRM has done two sales reps. CRM is, is going to stay, okay? Now, working with HubSpot, that's a challenge to Salesforce. Okay, Siebel is now uh, part of Oracle and it's gone. So CRM will always be there, but it's a system of record. It doesn't really make revenue. So we say that you know, we plug into your CRM because you don't want to challenge the status quo. You challenge the status quo, you're in trouble. Now we're just a CRM plug-in and we are. We add to those. See, so we add to what you currently have, whatever you use, or it becomes what you use if you don't have one. But we don't try to sell it as a CRM, even though I have the credibility for that, because you've made an investment, you have a contract, so we're saying we're an add-on. But what we're different in, okay, we are in a system of engagement, sales engagement, 
Now, here's the difference. See, some people like sales law often one of their sales cadence systems, and that's in a, one of the trends. And cadence was wildly successful the last several years because it addressed the discipline, the lack of discipline in, uh, in sales processes. But I'm thinking the, the new thing is about they're talking about you know sales relevance, that you need to be talking about what the people are interested in. So that's the next evolution. So the CRM sits in the background. It's like a bookshelf when you put your books on it, okay? And that's fine. But again, no one wants to put the books on there. So we're all about, because you're in the call, you're just clicking notes of what you're talking about. And we're updating the CRM more accurately than ever was before without you doing anything. The reps go, I'm liking that, okay? And we create a call map that if you don't record your calls, and 40% of the people in the United States, you have to have permission to do it. I just did that status, 35.6%, I think. So people are not recording other calls and certainly not listen to them. But a call map's invaluable if I'm going to pick up with you where I left off because I'm not relevant. You're thinking, wait a minute, you know, you didn't have the respect to remember what we talked about last time, and reps can't. So that's why it's different. So we're redefining it as a system of engagement. Our product is focused when they answer the phone about establishing and maintaining relevancy. That's the difference. So it's not a cadence system. It's not a, you know, it, yes, it updates the CRM, but the real value is you're going to stay with me as long as I'm relevant and no longer. So you are feeding me the information I need to instantly to talk when I talk to someone where I have everything automatically in front of me. And you've gone beyond that. Talk, tell us a little bit about what is an auto magic playbook? How are you helping us not only serve the information that we need to make the right communication, but how are you taking it to the next level with the sale, with onboarding training and auto magic playbooks? Right. Well, the first thing is to have a begin- an AI-generated opening statement that's relevant to you because they say you have seven seconds before you hang up, okay? Now, the playbook. Now, here's the real dichotomy. Everybody's focusing on you have a, a playbook, but everybody says, well, it's only good for the new sales reps that don't know or, you know, they know the stuff. True. They need it more so, so it's good for training. But the problem with playbooks, if it has everything in it you might need, it has nothing you need in a given phone call or like 80% of what you don't need. Now, each person is different. Each title is different. So the conversation, instead of a playbook, it should be a talk track, a guided conversation, a guided dialogue that's based upon our previous conversations and the sequence that we, I should discuss them. Now, I may, be, I may have written the talk, talking points. I may be the master and written 10 books on it. However, I'm going to be talking to you about what you're interested in. And I've talked to 100 people today, or you know, I'm going to talk to 100 people. I can't recall. So and having the AI, the magic playbook, the magic playbook says we look at everything about you and your marketing automation, what emails you open, what web pages you went to, how long you looked at things, how long you, we track how long you look at videos too, that's unique, how long you look at videos, your title, your industry, something like that, to come up with the things that most likely staff would be interested in in the sequence. So that's the automagic playbook. It is, it is being relevant to you, and reps don't need it necessarily to know what to say, but they need it as a little guide down the right column of what would be good discussion points. That is absolutely phenomenal. What are some of the biggest mistakes that business owners and sales professionals are making when it comes to communicating with their clients and prospects that you're helping them solve? I think the biggest mistake, people talk today about the show up and throw up is gone. And and they make jokes about, they'll think is, can I have 50 minutes of your time to better understand your needs? Uh, No. My needs, you know, so the problem we, that we solve, okay, and it's a little, a little nuanced here. I'll ask you a question here. How can you control what someone's thinking? By the questions I ask? You got it. You know how few people really know that? And that's the secret of sales is ask intelligent questions. Now, the question is, are you asking the questions because you need to know the answer? I suggest not. If you've done a good job of your marketing, okay, your marketing automation system, you know everything that staff would be interested in, and I know the facts on stuff, but I ask you questions to, to control what you're thinking and to let you buy my product. So that's the secret sauce, is to propose the question that I should ask, and I already know the answer or, you know, that you're probably going to give, but it's to make you talk so that you're reinforcing the pain that you have. So questions are about eliciting pain, not about learning. I mean, I better know most of the answers or I'm not really well prepared. Absolutely. Now, you have accomplished so much. What do you think are some of the biggest challenges you've overcome and what have you learned from them? Well, I guess um, it always goes back to you know being relevant, okay? Perceived value. 
And that even protect even to your employees, for example. Uh, I have, when I was acquired by the public company, and I went to work for them and did acquisitions for them before I started the CRM company. Great people. But they were shocked at my low turnover. And the reason I had low turnover is because I respected the people. And I used to say that, uh, I didn't say I would be slack and sloppy. They had to do their jobs. But if, if you can't uh, say that the quality of your people, as happy as they are, will be as happy as your customers are. And so they are your customer-facing thing. So I had very low turnover because I had happy customers and employees. So I say focusing on your employees. And if you get the best employees, you can attract the better employees. And so when you're a hot company, you, can, you really get a chance to screen and, and get nothing but the best. Now, one of the, my secrets, I think, that this is an entrepreneurial secret, if you will, it goes totally against what uh, the CPA, so I can pick all the accountants, okay? The accountants would say, Seth, you know, why? This is crazy for you to do this compensation thing to pay that guy so much money. And I'd say, Seth, watch this one. Okay, so what I would do is I would say that, uh, that all territories had to be equal, and then I would have variable compensation plans. And so if your quota, if you were going to make, let's just for numbers, $100,000 at quota, Okay, so you're, and you, you could sell a million, let's say, your commission is 10%. So if you sold, you know, only half a million, well, your commission should be 5%. And you go, well, I'll starve to death. And you say, yeah, and me too. Okay, but then on the other hand, you kick it out. You say, I can make that. So you blow out your uh, 100 and a million and a half. Your commission is a 15% on everything you sold. And so I created a huge disparity between the sales force. So some made magnificent money and, you know, maybe more than I had to pay them, but it it motivated everybody to say, I can do better. What I'm driving, you know, you said, well, park about this, you don't like, look in the car. You look in the parking lot. Why don't you do what she's doing? Why is she more successful than you are? Because she's doing the right things. And so we had the software to show them that. So you asked a simple question. It is our, I think, our focus on people, you know, attracting the right people and retaining the baby and motivate their behavior to be in sync with the business goals, which is secrets of my success. That is absolutely phenomenal. You are basically reinventing the industry that you created. What do you like best about what you're doing now? Well, I love it because it's all coming uh, around to me, for example. Okay, so if you look at the evolution, they went to Cadence, which is a good thing, and Cadence is important. There's nothing that Cadence products are really needed to instill discipline because sales reps are not going to follow the processes, you know, that they should follow on a regular basis. Cadence does that. So what we do is we add to that. But perhaps the most important thing is everybody started doing call recording so that they could uh, know what's going on. And now they're saying the new breakthrough is we're going to do transcription. Well, wait a minute. So it takes at least two pages per minute. A 20-minute call, you know, is 40 pages. That ain't going to happen. And then they do keyword search, for example. Oh, that's the answer. So do, do you like to fish, Seth? I do not. You don't? Okay. Well, they, they, you can relate to this example a little bit because I think selling is like fishing. But if, you, if you're going to – do you fish to eat or do you fish, you know, to fish? Uh, and if you're looking at um, the keyword search, it's like a fish – you know, finder, and you see all these fish down there, which is what you see in a, in a keyword search, you can't tell a salmon from a catfish, right? And so, so keyword search is horrible because it doesn't really show you. And if, if I use, if I'm calling a catfish or those spiny little fish instead of salmon, you know, it doesn't get the same thing. So we use a congruent, 100% accurate click note so we know what, what we're talking about. And so by making, so, so the recording, that people went to recording and no one's listening to it, which is why they're now saying we're going to transcribe it and do the key words. So they're really setting up for, for our automated capture of a story so far, a call map that is just done by the rep clicking things that's consistent. So it's evolving into my camp if you will. And they're starting to see, and I think the big thing I'm going to tell you is I think that the, it's going from, from training or co- you know, coaching, and that's what they started with, okay, into effectiveness. Efficiency is one thing, but it needs to be done effectiveness. That's what I mentioned about the insurance agents uh, that we're talking about. We've got one group that we should do the marketing with this week. They have 100,000 people that look, insurance agents that look to them. And they fell in love with our product because it has a knowledge repository written by an expert in sales for insurance agents. So he's written these books, whatever. And so we give insurance agents uh, the 82 different you know, rebuttals, they would say. They need specifics. Because to me, you know, just kidding, yesterday was the Masters, right? And so I got this Masters thing years ago. I lived in Atlanta. But it was the Masters of Golf. And I'm saying the selling insurance is the Masters of Selling. And so I love the fact that these insurance agents see this, wow. Because if the masters, if the, if the golf pros see it as good, everybody else will too. So it's evolving towards the sweet spot 
of being relevant, which it, you have to have a software like mine, and it's not recording calls. Nothing wrong with recording calls, but you need a map to them, but you don't need to record phone calls with our software. So Awesome. I know you are a voracious content consumer. What are three of your favorite books that have had the biggest impact on your career other than the ones you wrote? Oh my God, that's a tough question. You know, I need to think about that one because you've asked three and I'm drawing a blank as to one I would come up with the top three. Then do gonna, five, do one, do 10, pick your Yeah, mind. I know, I know. And I do read them. You know, I read a lot of sales books, okay? Like um, Solution Selling, okay? Question-based selling is pretty impactful. Probably um, one of the ones that's most impactful, Art right, Soap Check's written book, okay, on selling. And so, but they're different pitches. Like the QBS, question-based selling book, was important. Question-based selling, and what you and I just talked about, okay, asking the questions. Art right, Soap Check talks about don't be a dumbass when they t answer the phone. Now, he didn't use those words, but it affected. He's about, you know, like, are you kidding me? And he quotes all these conversations that people have. So he brings some real realism here. So that's kind of my thing is, is focusing focusing on, you know, books on selling. So that's the books I read the most of. That is very helpful. You know, we've covered so much in such a short period of time. What else do you want to share that I didn't think to ask you yet? Well, I think we pretty much covered everything, except I think the industry is changing dramatically. It would kind of maybe make a little, I'll close a little short summer in the industry. If we go like the, you know, I started CRM, and then Tom Siebel came into it, and Tom Siebel built his business based upon creating job security, okay? Now, interestingly enough, I'd say that is a play on, you know, a partnership play because he got Anderson Consulting to promote him. George Shaheen, the managing partner, you know, loved it because Siebel generated $5 of revenue for each $1 of services, and we only we were one-to-one. -one. George Shaheen became the CEO of Siebel. See? So you see things change. And another thing, and I guess one thing, the point I'm trying to make is things can change dramatically. You think Mark Benioff comes along, okay? And Mark Benioff, what he did to software industries like what restaurants did to grocery stores, okay? <laughs> you know, yes, you could go to the grocery store and you could buy all this stuff and take the time to cook it and it was good for you. But he has a restaurant. He's saying you don't need to go all that, all that hassle, software as a service. So he redefined the industry to software as a service. And so even like even the phone systems here, your phone is the last thing that your phone is used for is, is talking. It's your text. It's your email. It's your navigator. You know, it's your calendar. Yes, it happens to do phone calls as well, right? So you see things evolving. And I, I wanted to close by saying that things will evolve, and they'll evolve dramatically. And I would like to believe that what we're doing is going to be as impactful as Mark Benioff did when he redefined software as a service. I'm thinking is we're going to redefine that sales engagement is about sales relevance, which means having a, a guided conversation. Not that the people don't know what to say, but they don't know what to say to this person and they're not respectful about relevance. So that's kind of the pitch. That is absolutely fantastic. We greatly appreciate your time. We know it's incredibly valuable. This has been Seth Green for Sharkpreneur with Richard Brock of salesrelevance.com. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Seth. Thanks everybody for watching or listening and we'll talk to you next time. Do you need money to fund your idea, product or service? Are you ready to take your business to the next level but need capital to get it done? Kevin Harrington has heard more than 50,000 pitches and knows how to help you make the perfect pitch to get the funding for your entrepreneurial dream. He's distilled the process down in his perfect pitch cheat sheet and it's yours for free. Just text pitch to him right now at 727-888 2100. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 right now and claim your free perfect pitch cheat sheet. Text PITCH to 727-888-2100 to start funding your dream today. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC. To discover how you can have your own show completely done for you and turn it into a real published book and become the authority in your marketplace, go to www.marketdominationllc.com slash podcast offer.